the wives of the sons of Jacob. Judah was the first of the sons of Jacob to enter wedlock. After the sale of Joseph to the Midianites, his brothers had said to Judah, If conditions were as before, her father would provide wives for us now. As it is, he is entirely absorbed by his grief for Joseph, and we must look about for wives ourselves. You are our chief, and you should marry first. Judah's marriage with Olet, the daughter of the noble merchant Shua, which was consummated at Adullam, was not happy. His two oldest sons died, and shortly thereafter his wife also. It was Judah's punishment for having begun a good deed and left it unfinished, for he who begins a good deed and does not execute it to the end brings down misfortune on his own head. Judah had rescued Joseph from death, but it was his suggestion to sell him into slavery. Had he urged them to restore the lad to his father, his brothers would have obeyed his words. So he was lacking in persistence until he completed the work of Joseph's deliverance, which he had begun. In the same year, the year of Joseph's misfortune, all his other brothers married also. Reuben's wife was named Eliorum, the daughter of the Canaanite Uzi of Timnah. Simon married his sister Dinah first, and then a second wife. When Simon and Levi massacred the men of Shechem, Dinah refused to leave the city and follow her brothers, saying, How shall I carry my shame? But Simon swore he would marry her, and when she died in Egypt he took her body to the Holy Land and buried it there. Dinah bore her brother a son, and from her union with Shechem sprang a daughter, Asenath by name, afterward the wife of Joseph. When this daughter was born to Dinah, her brothers, the sons of Jacob, wanted to kill her, that the finger of men might not point at the fruit of sin in their father's house. But Jacob took a piece of tin, inscribed the holy name on it, and bound it around the neck of the baby girl, put her under a thorn bush, and abandoned her. An angel carried the babe down to Egypt, where Potiphar adopted her as his child, for his wife was barren. Years later, when Joseph traveled through the land as viceroy, the maidens threw gifts at him to make him turn their eyes in their direction and give them the opportunity of gazing on his beauty. Asenath possessed nothing that would do as a present. Therefore, she took off the amulet suspended from her neck and gave it to him. In this way, Joseph became acquainted with her lineage, and he married her, seeing that she was not an Egyptian, but one connected with the house of Jacob through her mother. Besides the son of Dinah, Simon had another son whose name was Saul, by Buna, the damsel he had taken captive in the campaign against Shechem. Levi and Ishakar married two daughters of Jobab, the grandson of Eber. The wife of the former was named Adina, and the wife of the latter, Arida. Dan's wife was Elphlelet, a daughter of the Moabite, Hamadon. For a long time their marriage remained childless, Finally, they had a son who they called Husham. Gad and Naphtali married women from Haran, two sisters, daughters of Amram, a grandson of Nahor. Naphtali's wife, Meramit, was the older of the two, and the younger, the wife of Gad, was named Uzit. Asher's first wife was Adon, the daughter of Ephlal, a grandson of Ishmael. She died childless, and he married a second wife, Adora, a daughter of Abimael, the grandson of Shem. She had been married before, her first husband having been Malkiel, also a grandson of Shem. And the issue of this first marriage was a daughter, Sirah, by name. When Asher brought his wife to Canaan, the three-year-old orphan, Sirah, came with them. She was raised in the house of Jacob, and she walked in the way of pious children, and God gave her beauty, wisdom, and sagacity. Zebulon's wife was Merosha, the daughter of Molad, a grandson of Midian, the son of Abraham by Keturah, Hagar. For Benjamin, when he was but ten years old, Jacob took Malia to wife, the daughter of Aram, the grandson of Terah, and she bore him five sons. At the age of eighteen he married a second wife, 
Arbat, the daughter of Zimran, a son of Abraham by Keturah, and by her he had five sons. Joseph, the slave of Potiphar. When Joseph was sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites, he kept silent out of respect for his brothers and did not tell his masters that he was a son of Jacob, a great and powerful man. Even when he came to the Midianites with the Ishmaelites and the former asked after his parentage, he still said he was a slave, only in order not to put his brothers to shame. But the most distinguished of the Midianites rebuked Joseph, saying, You are no slave, your appearance betrays you. And he threatened him with death unless he acknowledged the truth. Joseph, however, was steadfast. He would not act treacherously towards his brothers. Arrived in Egypt, the owners of Joseph could come to no agreement regarding him. Each desired to have sole and exclusive possession. They therefore decided to leave him with the shopkeeper until they should come back to Egypt. And God let Joseph find grace in the sight of the shopkeeper. All that he had, his whole house, he put into Joseph's hands, and therefore the Lord blessed him with much silver and gold. Joseph remained with him for three months and five days. At that time, the wife of Potiphar came from Memphis and cast her eyes on Joseph, of whose beauty she had heard from the eunuchs. She told her husband how a certain shopkeeper had grown rich through a young Hebrew, and she added, But it is said that the youth was stolen away out of the land of Canaan. Go, therefore, and sit in judgment on his owner, and take the youth to your house, that the God of the Hebrews may bless you, for the grace of heaven rests on him. Potiphar summoned the shopkeeper, and when he appeared before him, he spoke harshly to him, saying, what is this, I hear, that you steal souls from the land of Canaan and buy and sell them? The shopkeeper protested his innocence, and he could not be made to recede from his assertion that a company of Ishmaelites had left Joseph in his charge temporarily, until they should return. Potiphar had him stripped naked and beaten, but he continued to reiterate the same story. Then Potiphar summoned Joseph. The youth prostrated himself before this chief, for he was third in rank of the officers of Pharaoh. Potiphar addressed Joseph and said, Are you a slave or a freeborn man? And Joseph replied, A slave. Potiphar continued to question him, Whose slave are you? Joseph, I belong to the Ishmaelites. Potiphar, how were you made a slave? Joseph, they bought me in the land of Canaan. But Potiphar refused to believe what he said, and he had Joseph also stripped and beaten. The wife of Potiphar, standing by the door, saw how Joseph was abused, and she sent word to her husband, Your verdict is unjust, for you punished the freeborn youth that was stolen away from his place as though he were the one that had committed a crime. As Joseph held firmly to what he had said, Potiphar ordered him to prison until his masters should return. In her sinful longing for him, Potiphar's wife wanted to have Joseph in her own house, and she remonstrated with her husband with these words, Why do you keep the captive, a nobly born slave, a prisoner? You should rather set him at liberty and have him serve you. He answered, the law of the Egyptians does not permit us to take what belongs to another before all titles are made clear. And Joseph stayed in prison for 24 days until the return of the Ishmaelites to Egypt. Meanwhile, the Ishmaelites had heard somewhere that Joseph was the son of Jacob, and they said to him, Why did you pretend you were a slave? We have information that you are the son of a powerful man in Canaan and your father mourns for you in sackcloth. Joseph was on the point of divulging his secret, but he kept a check on himself for the sake of his brothers, and he repeated that he was a slave. Nevertheless, the Ishmaelites decided to sell him, that he be not found in their hands, for they feared the revenge of Jacob, who, they knew, was in high favor with the Lord God and with men. 
the shopkeeper begged the Ishmaelites to rescue him from the prosecution of Potiphar and clear him from the suspicion of man theft. The Ishmaelites, in turn, had a conference with Joseph and asked him to testify before Potiphar that they had bought him for money. He did so, and then the chief of the eunuchs liberated him from prison and dismissed all parties concerned. With the permission of her husband, Potiphar's wife sent a eunuch to the Ishmaelites, telling him to buy Joseph. But he returned and reported that they had demanded an exorbitant price for the slave. She dispatched a second eunuch, charging him to conclude the bargain, and, even if they asked one mina of gold, or even two, he was not to be thrifty with the money. He was to be sure to buy the slave and bring him to her. The eunuch gave the Ishmaelites 80 pieces of gold for Joseph, telling his mistress, however, that he had paid out a hundred pieces. Joseph noticed the deception, but he kept silent, that the eunuch might not be put to shame. Thus, Joseph became the slave of the idolatrous priest Potiphar, or Potiphera as he was sometimes called. He had secured possession of the handsome youth for a lewd purpose, but the angel Gabriel mutilated him in such a manner that he could not accomplish it. His master soon had occasion to notice that Joseph was as pious as he was beautiful, for whenever he was occupied with his ministrations, he would whisper a prayer. O Lord of the world, you are my trust, you are my protection. Let me find grace and favor in your sight, and in the sight of all that see me, and in the sight of my master, Potiphar. When Potiphar noticed the movements of his lips, he said to Joseph, Are you casting a spell on me? No, replied Joseph. I am beseeching God to find favor in your eyes. His prayer was heard. Potiphar convinced himself that God was with Joseph. Sometimes he would make a test of Joseph's miraculous powers. If Joseph brought him a glass of Hippocrass, he would say, I would rather have wine mixed with absinthe. And straightway the spiced wine was changed into bitter wine. Whatever he desired, he could be sure to get it from Joseph, and he saw clearly that God fulfilled the wishes of his slave. Therefore, he put all the keys of his house into Joseph's hands, and he did not spy on him, keeping back nothing from Joseph but his wife. Seeing that the Shekinah rested on him, Potiphar treated Joseph not as a slave, but as a member of his family, for he said, This youth is not cut out for a slave's work. He is worthy of a prince's place. Accordingly, he provided instruction for him in the arts and ordered him to have all things better than the other slaves. Joseph thanked God for his new and happy state. He prayed, Blessed are you, O Lord, that you have let me to forget my father's house. What made his present fortune so agreeable was that he was removed from the envy and jealousy of his brothers. He said, When I was in my father's house and he gave me something pretty, my brothers begrudged me of the present. And now, O Lord, I thank you that I live amid plenty. Free from anxieties, he turned his attention to his external appearance. He painted his eyes, dressed his hair, and aimed to be elegant in his walk. But God spoke to him, saying, Your father is in mourning in sackcloth and ashes, while you eat, drink, and dress your hair, and prance about. Therefore, I will stir up your mistress against you, and you shall be embarrassed. Thus, Joseph's secret wish was fulfilled, that he might be permitted to prove his piety under temptation, as the piety of his fathers had been tested. Joseph and Zuliaika Like Rachel his mother, Joseph was of ravishing beauty, and the wife of his master was filled with invincible passion for him. Her feeling was heightened by the astrological forecast that she was destined to have descendants through Joseph. This was true, but not in the sense she understood. Joseph married her daughter, Asenath, later on, and she bore him children, thus fulfilling what had been read in the stars. In the beginning, she did not confess her love to Joseph, 
She tried first to seduce him by artifice. On the pretext of visiting him, she would go to him at night, and as she had no sons, she would pretend a desire to adopt him. Joseph then prayed to God on her behalf, and she bore a son. However, she continued to embrace him as though he were her own child. Still, he did not notice her evil designs. Finally, when he recognized her want and trickery, he mourned many days and endeavored to turn her away from her sinful passion by the word of God. She, on her side, often threatened him with death and castigated him in order to make him amenable to her will. When these means had no effect on Joseph, she sought to seduce him with enticements. She would say, I promise you, you shall rule over me and all I have if you will just give yourself up to me, and you shall be to me the same as my lawful husband. But Joseph was mindful of the words of his fathers, and he went to his chamber and fasted and prayed to God that he would deliver him from the seductions of the Egyptian woman. In spite of the mortifications he practiced, and though he gave the poor and sick the food apportioned to him, his master thought he lived a luxurious life, for those that fast for the glory of God are made beautiful of continence. The wife of Potiphar would frequently speak to her husband in praise of Joseph's chastity, in order that he might conceive no suspicion of the state of her feelings. And again, she would encourage Joseph secretly, telling him not to fear her husband, that he was convinced of his purity, and though one should carry tales to him about Joseph and herself, Potiphar would lend them no credence. And when she saw that all this was ineffectual, she approached him with the request that he teach her the word of God saying, If it be your wish that I forsake idol worship, then fulfill my desire, and I will persuade that Egyptian husband of mine to forsake idols, and then we shall walk in the law of your God. Joseph replied, The Lord desires that those who fear him shall not walk in impurity, nor has he pleasure in the adulterer. Another time she came to him and said, If you will not do my desire, I will murder the Egyptian and marry you according to the law. Then Joseph ripped his garments and said, O oh woman, fear the Lord. Do not execute this evil deed. Do not bring destruction down on yourself, for I will proclaim your impious deeds to all in public. Next, she sent him a dish prepared with magic spells by means of which she hoped to get him into her power. But when the eunuch set it before him, he saw the image of a man handing him a sword together with the dish, and warned by the vision, he took care not to taste the food. A few days later, his mistress came to him and asked him why he had not eaten what she had sent. He reproached her, saying, The God of my fathers has revealed your iniquity to me through an angel, but that you understand that the malice of the wicked has no power over those who fear God. I shall eat your food before your eyes and the God of my fathers and the angel of Abraham will be with me. The wife of Potiphar then fell on her face at the feet of Joseph, and amid tears she promised not to commit this sin again. But her unholy passion for Joseph did not depart from her, and her distress over her unfilled wish made her look so ill that her husband said to her, Why is your countenance fallen? And she replied, because I have a pain at my heart, and the groanings of my spirit oppress me. Once, when she was alone with Joseph, she rushed towards him, crying, I will jump into a well or a pit if you do not yield yourself to me. Noticing her extreme agitation, Joseph endeavored to calm her with these words. Remember, if you were to kill yourself, your husband's concubine, Astaho, your rival, will maltreat your children and exterminate your memory from the earth. These words, gently spoken, had the opposite effect from that intended. They only inflamed her passion the more by feeding her hopes. She said, There, see, you do love me. It pleasures me that you take thought of me and the safety of my children. I expect now that my desire will be fulfilled. She did not know that Joseph spoke as he did for the sake of God and not for her sake. His mistress, or as she was called, Zuliaika, pursued him day after day with her amorous talk and flattery, saying, 
How fair is your appearance! How comely your form! Never have I seen so well favored a slave as you. Joseph would reply, God, who formed me in my mother's womb, has created all men. Zuliaika, how beautiful are your eyes, with which you have charmed all Egyptians, both men and women. Joseph, beautiful as they may be while I am alive, so ghastly they will be to look at in the grave. Zuliaika, how lovely and pleasant are your words. I pray you, take your harp, play and sing that I may hear your words. Joseph, lovely and pleasant are my words when I proclaim the praise of God. Zuliaika, how beautiful is your hair. Take my golden comb and comb it. Joseph, how long will you continue to speak to me so? Leave me alone. It would be better for you to take care of your household. Zuliaika, there is nothing in my house I care for but you alone. But Joseph's virtue was unshaken. While she spoke in this way, he did not so much as raise his eyes to look at his mistress. He remained equally steadfast when she lavished gifts on him, for she provided him with garments of one kind for the morning, another for noon, and a third kind for the evening. Nor could threats move him. She would say, I will bring false accusations against you before your master. And Joseph would reply, The Lord executes judgment for the oppressed. Or, I will deprive you of food. Whereon Joseph, the Lord gives food to the hungry. Or, I will have you thrown into prison. Whereon Joseph, the Lord frees the prisoners. Or, I will put heavy labor on you that will bend you double. Whereon Joseph, the Lord raises up those that are bowed down, or I will blind your eyes. Whereon Joseph, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. When she began to exercise her blandishments on him, he rejected them with the words, I fear my master. But Zuliaika would say, I will kill him. Joseph replied with indignation, not enough that you would make an adulterer of me, you would have me be a murderer besides. And he spoke furthermore, saying, I fear the Lord my God. Zuliaika, nonsense, he is not here to see you. Joseph, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable, and he knows all. Then she took Joseph into her chamber where an idol hung above the bed. This she covered, that it might not be a witness to what she was about to do. Joseph said, Though you cover the eyes of the idol, remember the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth. Joseph continued, I have many reasons not to do this thing for the sake of God. Adam was banished from paradise on account of violating a light command. How much more should I have to fear the punishment of God if I commit so grave a sin as adultery? The Lord is in the habit of choosing a favorite member of our family as a sacrifice to himself. Perhaps he desires to make this choice of me, but if I do your will, I will make myself unfit to be a sacrifice to God. Also, the Lord is in the habit of appearing suddenly, in visions of the night, to those that love him. So he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I fear that he may appear to me at the very moment I am defiling myself with you. And as I fear God, so I fear my father, who withdrew the birthright from his firstborn son, Reuben, on account of an immoral act, and gave it to me. Were I to fulfill your desire, I would share the fate of my brother Reuben. With such words, Joseph endeavored to cure the wife of his master of the wanton passion she had conceived for him, while he took heed to keep far from a heinous sin not from fear of the punishment that would follow, nor out of consideration for the opinion of men, but because he desired to sanctify the name of God, blessed be he, before the whole world. It was this feeling of his that Zuliaika could not comprehend, and when finally, carried away by passion, she told him in unmistakable language what she desired, and he recoiled from her, she said to Joseph, 
Why do you refuse to fulfill my wish? Am I not a married woman? None will find out what you have done. Joseph replied, If the unmarried women of the heathen are prohibited to us, how much more their married women? As the Lord lives, I will not commit this crime. In this, Joseph followed the example of many pious men who utter such an oath at the moment when they are in danger of succumbing to temptation and seek thus to gather moral courage to control their evil instincts. When Zuliaika could not prevail on him, her desire threw her into a grievous sickness, and all the women of Egypt came to visit her, and they said to her, Why are you so languid and depressed, you that lack nothing? Is not your husband a great prince, esteemed in the sight of the king? Is it possible that there is anything you can't have, anything your heart desires? Zuliaika answered them, saying, Today I shall make it known to you how I have come to the state I am in. Then she commanded her maidservants to prepare food for all the women, and she spread a banquet before them. She placed knives on the table to peel the oranges, and then ordered Joseph to appear, arrayed in costly garments, and wait on her guests. When Joseph came in, the women could not take their eyes off him. They all cut their hands with the knives, and the oranges in their hands were covered with blood. But they, not knowing what they were doing, continued to look on the beauty of Joseph. They could not turn their eyes away from him. Then Zuliaika said to them, What have you done? Behold, I set oranges before you to eat, and you have cut your hands. All the women looked at their hands, and lo, they were full of blood, and it flowed down and stained their garments. They said to Zuliaika, This slave in your house, he enchanted us. We could not turn our eyes away from him. Then Zuliaika said, This happened to you when you looked on him but a moment, and you could not refrain yourselves? How then can I control myself in this house he lives in? I see him go in and out, day after day. How then should I not wither away, or keep from languishing on account of him? And the women said, It is true. Who can look on this beauty and refrain her feelings? But he is your slave. Why do you not disclose to him that which is in your heart, rather than suffering and perishing through this thing? Zuliaika answered them, Daily do I endeavor to persuade him, but he will not consent to my wishes. I promise him everything that is fair, yet I have met with no success from him, and therefore I am sick, as you may see. Her sickness increased. Her husband and household did not suspect the cause of her decline, but all the women that were her friends knew that it was on account of her love for Joseph, and they advised her always to try and entice the youth. On a certain day, while Joseph was doing his master's work in the house, Zuliaika came and fell suddenly on him. But Joseph was stronger than she, and he pressed her down to the floor. Zuliaika wept, and in a voice of supplication and in bitterness of soul, she said to Joseph, Have you ever known, seen, or heard of a woman my equal in beauty, let alone a woman with beauty exceeding mine? Yet I try daily to persuade you. I fall into sickness through love of you. I confer all this honor on you, and you will not hear my voice. Is it by reason of fear of your master that he punish you? As the king lives, no harm shall come to you on account of this thing. I pray you, listen to me, and consent to my desire for the sake of the honor I have conferred on you, and take away this death from me. Why should I die on account of you? Joseph remained as steadfast as before. Zuliaika, however, was not discouraged. She continued her solicitations unceasingly, day after day, month after month, for a whole year, but always with the least success, for Joseph, in his chastity, did not permit himself to even look at her. Then she resorted to constraint. She had an iron shackle placed on his chin, and he was compelled to keep his head up and look her in the face. Next, Joseph resists temptation. End Part 26 of 95, The Legends of the Jews.com.